All right, I've got my tea. Pros, enough units to set your CPU on fire, underwater robotic spider monkeys, and this bullshit. Cons, oceans that are a little bit too clear, unit pathing that thinks mountains are fields, and a storyline that's about as exciting as the DMV. Anyway, I'm the Happy Tao, and welcome to the Supreme Commander Review. Alright, so flashback to 2007. The iPhone was just announced, the US still gave a crap about science, and Obama is hot shit. 2007 also happened to be the year in which a bunch of high-profile RTS games debuted, namely Universe at War, Command & Conquer 3, Company of Heroes Opposing Fronts, World in Conflict, and Colonization the Game, War Elephant Edition. You'd think that with enough RTSs coming out to keep people in a perpetual state of hibernation, it would be a pretty tough job to release a new IP and have that new IP be your very first RTS game to boot. Well, that's exactly what the mad lads at Gas Powered Games did. Not only that, but they dropped Subcom in February, smack dab at the start of the year. Apparently, life mimicked your average cybering commander because Gas Powered Games' gun blazing strategy totally worked. The game got an average of 8.4 to 8.5 on its reviews, and by god did it deserve it. It's too bad the series kinda fell apart when Supreme Commander 2 was announced, but hey, we don't have to acknowledge that game. To be honest, part of the reason for Subcom 1's success is that it's a spiritual successor to Total Annihilation, and while I haven't played that one, I've heard it was a blast. Seriously, Chris Taylor deserves like an RTS knighthood that again might get taken away for his later stuff, but enough with the history, let's get into the game. The year is, well, crazy far into the future, it really doesn't matter. Humanity has space gates and a massive British Empire complex, and for a while, it kinda works. Everybody's living in harmony, there's a human golden age, and the United Kingdom, I mean the Earth Empire, has kept more or less a stable grip on everything. However, Chris Taylor needed a game, so tech eventually outpaced morality, and we got the symbionts. Essentially, the result of taking the Terminator and diluting him a couple hundred times, the symbionts are a race of human-AI hybrids that represented a a massive amount of potential for humanity as a whole. In response, the Empire enslaved every single one of them. Yeah, this is gonna be a theme, folks. Incredibly pissed off that his people were essentially do not pass goad on year one, the scientist who created the symbionts, Big Boy Brackman, and his totally not a HAL 9000 reference AI, took a big ship full of freed symbionts and booked it to the outer regions, thus creating the Cybran Nation. They're kind of the rebel alliance of the game, they don't have that much health, but they have a ton of super versatile units, and by super versatile I mean... Yeah. Anyway, while Space UK's colonies are pulling in America and rebelling all over the place, there's a bit of a situation on another colony. The colonists weren't the first ones there. Enter the Seraphim, first contact baby. Turns out the Seraphim are actually a bunch of alien Bob Rosses that are fans of Harmony and the color green. The colonists end up adopting a lot of the Seraphim's culture, technology, and ideology, but to be honest, they were probably just happy that the Seraphim didn't want to murder the shit out of them. To which the Earth Empire promptly decides to murder the shit out of them, because they're massive space racists. This pissed off most of the colony, who really liked the Seraphim. So three years later, in the name of peace, they started bombing the Earth Empire with big old armies of their own, now calling themselves the Aeon Illuminate. Essentially, the insert religious faction here choice, they use a ton of hover drives and have really good specialized units, but the Holy War ain't cheap and neither are their alien-inspired war machines. At this point, the Earth Empire is less of an empire in more of an insecure nation state. Acknowledging that things are not okay in Galaxy Town, they elect Space Reagan, bring the militarization up to 11, and pledge to bring the other two factions back under their... Oh, yeah, they're essentially the Terran Republic. The Cybran are just Red New Conglomerate, and the Aeon are just Green Vanu. But hey, different colors. Anyway, finally, the Earth Empire rebrands as the United Earth Federation. They're the Galactic Empire, right down to the big fucking gun, but with a little bit of inner conflict thrown in for flavor. Their units are tough as balls and can take a real beating, but they're also slower than a snail riding a turtle, so don't expect lightning-fast plays. That being said, who needs speed when you've got land battleships? So 
anyways, the three factions play nuclear dodgeball for a little while until some dude comes up with the Armored Command Unit, or ACU for short. You play as these. Essentially, they're mobile factories that can 3D print plastic armies almost as fast as Games Workshop can overprice them. This eliminates the need for human soldiers and war turns into two armored big brains taunting each other for a couple weeks before one of them inevitably gets their ass handed to them. This turns the heat up and ironically, even more people die from collateral damage. And to top it off, this shit has been going on for close to 1,000 years and it doesn't look like it's gonna stop anytime soon. However, the galaxy's big bads didn't calculate that a random dude with a keyboard would come in and turn the tide of the war for them, which is where you come in. You can choose from the three factions at the start of the campaign, which brings us to the actual missions. They're... okay. Oftentimes, the gameplay is incredibly basic, to the point where most objectives dilute to build this unit, move over here, whack that guy, so it already doesn't start on a strong foot. This is only compounded by the fact that Supreme Commander takes these really interesting ingredients for a high-quality RTS storyline and opens a McDonald's with them. I guess this was because writing an intricate and developed plot that plays upon the inner conflict of three factions as they struggle to find their identity in the chaos of a thousand years of war just wasn't as easy as what the fuck? Oh yeah, that brings us to the endings. I don't want to spoil too much about the finales, but almost all of them go the same way. Essentially, there's this big fuck-off Death Star that the UEF is building and everybody else is trying to stop it. The endings correspond to the faction you choose. The blue boys live up to their theme and commit mass genocide, the robots hack into the gun and blow up all the quantum gates, and the Aeons straight up throw their queen into the exhaust port. Whichever color you choose, the infinite war ends. It's not as blatantly choose your flavor of laser as Mass Effect 3's endings are but it's pretty close. Honestly, Mass Effect 3's endings is kinda how I would explain the entirety of the Supreme Commander campaign, so again, don't expect too much. Anyway, that's all I've really got to say about the campaign, so fuck it, let's get on to the good stuff. Alright, so remember that this is a game from 2007, so the graphics are, uh, classic. That being said, the graphics designers definitely earned their paycheck. I mean, shit, they have individually rendered trees in Nino games that didn't quite make it past that hurdle. The factions all have pretty well fleshed out themes, unless you're these guys, in which case you're just chrome as fuck. Yeah, I know, we'll get to them. The only gripe I have is that the oceans look really bad, or rather, they don't look like anything at all, because half the time they're just a blue abyss, which would be fine if you only saw the water surface, but no, you can straight up stare through the ocean, and it can be really disorienting at times. The short lines look good though. As for the sound quality, it's pretty amazing. Here, listen for yourself. It's really satisfying when your artillery barrage doesn't sound like an expensive nerf gun. In fact, I almost don't want to move on from sound because now I have to address one of the really big problems of Supreme Commander, and that's the unit pathing. Dear God, the unit pathing. I have reason to believe that Supreme Commander's pathing AI was a prototype for Apple Maps. I mean, Christ, drunk drivers can at least vaguely go in one direction. The worst case of this is with the Tier 1 units, which are so small and so numerous that the game's AI just shits its pants when you try to move them somewhere. Your units can, and will, run into each other, decide that driving through a hill is the quickest route to your destination, and God help you if you need to round a corner because each and every single one of those little fuckers is gonna stop to admire the landscape. If you're really mean, you can take advantage of this by building a maze that the other guy has to get through to get to your base. However, get ready for some angry Discord messages. Uh, lastly, the graphics requirements. Now, if this review was being done 13 years earlier, I'd say it's a pretty intensive game, but most setups nowadays will run it like a knife through butter. Alright, so enough on presentation, let's discuss gameplay. Okay, so before we talk about committing war crimes, we need to discuss your armored thick boy, or your ACU. This is your command unit, and it can do a little bit of everything. Its primary functions boil down to more factories, please, and telling early game rushes to get fucked, but you can also go full bionicles and strap extra shit on there. The upgrade that your commander gets is directly correlated to which flavor of awesome you chose. The Cybran put their energy into hiding, the Aeon get a MOBA-style stun lock, and the UEF engineers, who have an unyielding hate boner for all life in the galaxy, that's not them said fuck safety and just decided to bolt a tactical weapon onto their commander's back. 
If your ACU sounds really, really powerful, guess what? It's because it is. The downside to getting a watered-down Gundam suit at the start of the game is that you only get one of them, so you have to be kind of careful with where you walk them around, especially since they're the slow fat kid. If you want a more expendable option, you can also make sub-commanders. You can build as many of them as you want, and you don't lose if they die, so they make excellent, uh diplomatic envoys. Alright, let's move on to bases. When you first start a match, you're teleported Terminator style onto the map. Besides your ACU and your very own free crater, you got jack shit. However, no matter which map you choose, there are incredibly convenient green spots on the ground. These are called mass nodes, and they are massively important. Mass is one of the two resources you'll need to ho I mean stockpile in the game, the other being energy. The latter can be produced by slapping some less than OSHA compliant reactors on the ground. Seriously, these things might as well be sold by Samsung. But mass is a little bit more finite. You can only pump it out of the ground from those green spots, or if you're so inclined to make your base even more prone to spontaneous combustion, you can build fabricators which give you one or two points of mass per second in return for the power requirements of a small megacity. Keep in mind that in Supreme Commander, resources are generated per second, and if you run out of them, your building will be complete by the time your ally has won the game. In order to prevent this from happening, you can build storage structures which you should probably protect because they have a bad habit of developing a bad case of dead. Anyways, once you have some resource towers up, you should start making some unit factories which are your main way of pumping out diplomatic solutions. Factories also have three different tech levels, with each one giving some access to progressively thicker units. Each of these factories can be set on auto-build too, so you can come up with your preferred recipe of highly lethal robots and forget about them, until you come back to look at your base and realize that you have accidentally created an armada. Added to the resource nodes and factories, there's a lot of specialty buildings that you can put wherever the hell you want. Some of these are point defense turrets, which protect your base from Highlander-style ground charges and Pearl Harbor, and shield generators that prevent any projectiles from coming through. Oh, 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 shit, yeah, projectiles! Fuck, I almost completely forgot about those. Yeah, projectiles are really cool in this game. Okay, so one of my favorite parts of Supreme Commander is that most projectiles aren't hit scan, which means your guys can miss, or if you're even luckier, they can pull up to your army with 50 barrels worth of fuck you, only to be annihilated because their firing path was blocked by a small hill. This also means that if your opponent fields nothing but artillery, you can render their overwhelming firepower completely useless with a couple of well-timed dance moves. And speaking of projectiles, yeah, you get access to nukes. These are essentially self-propelled middle fingers that have to be built at the Tech 3 launch site before you can actually go Evil Knievel on someone's ass. But once they're made, they can turn a fortified base into a radioactive cautionary tale. They're so powerful, in fact, that the game actually gives you a voice warning when one is launched, which gives you about 30 seconds to shit your pants before the end comes. Get the fuck out of here! What are you doing? Go, bitch! Get the fuck out of here, you stupid idiot! Fuck, we're all dead! Get the fuck out! Careful though, because all three factions have access to nukes, and all three factions have access to nuke defense, which means if you build towards Armageddon and everyone else does too, you can get bogged down in a virtual cold war. Let's take a look at unit design, because it's fucking fantastic. Okay, so the units produced in your factories come in three different flavors. Land, air, and completely disgusting. I mean, uh, sea. Alright, let's discuss land units. This is usually made up of assault bots, anti-air, artillery, and speedy boys. Tech 2 has stuff like mobile shield generators and flat cannons, where Tech 3, well, Tech 3 just kind of turns the game into Mech Warrior. Air units play a little bit differently in that they take a bit longer to build and they cost a little bit more. That being said, I don't know of a single problem that can't be solved by just spamming Tech 1 UEF bombers. Seriously, fuck these guys. Tech 2 opens up stuff like gunships and torpedo bombers, where Tech 3 is just really Tech 1 units but on fucking steroids. Anyway, that brings us to the naval combat. Okay, so this one isn't actually actually going to be present on every map, but if you get enough of it, it can really <laughs> turn the tide. Tier 1 has stuff like frigates and submarines, with the former being the meat and potatoes of your navy, and the latter just being really fucking annoying. Tier 2 gives you destroyers and AA cruisers, but eh, who cares about that? Tier 3 is where the real fun shit happens. It is at this tech level that you get access to battleships. You could just use your big boys to 1v5 the other guy's boat parade, but the real fun in battleships is using them to deliver friendship shells to the other guy's base from over a mile away. 
And if you really want to be a dick, you can make carriers and then load those carriers with strategic bombers because, uh, fuck you, I guess? Anyway, combined arms is cool, but where Supreme Commander really shines is the absolutely mental amount of hidden abilities that every unit gets. The Cybran, being the poster bots of versatility, are probably the best example of this. We're talking about a faction that has underwater tanks, assault bots that double as builders, suicide bomb bots, mobile invisibility generators, rocket bots, radar jamming gunships, an AA gun that can shoot ground units, and possibly the coolest unit in RTS games, period, let alone Supreme Commander, naval destroyers that bring a whole new meaning to the phrase sea legs. And the other factions have some pretty cool stuff too. A lot of the Aeon units have hover drives, which essentially allows them to be naval combatants. As if the Aeon Navy needed another reason to be full of itself. And and the UEF, well, I mean, they've got the best transports in the game? Ya yeah, basic. One unit that every factory can make, regardless of its type, are engineers. Essentially, the wrenchy boys of Supreme Commander, they're the tireless little robots that keep your base running when your ACU isn't there. They're also completely defenseless and make a tasty snack for any raiding party, so try and keep them alive it can be kind of difficult. Engineers also come in three different tech levels, with each one giving access to new buildings and making the engineers slightly thicker. That being said, the real reward for getting Tech 3 engineers is getting access to another one of the main reasons to play Supreme Commander, the experimental units. The de facto Tech 4 Master Chad units of the game, the experimentals emphasize and amplify the strengths and weaknesses of the factions by a truckload. The downside is that they can take a bit of time to build, and they require enough resources to supply a small continent for a year, but once they're built, you're gonna have a good time. Whether it's a miniature Dyson Sphere, a giant spider bot that has stealth of all things, or an artillery piece that can hit anywhere on the map, experimentals can end the game. And at that, no one faction is necessarily the B all end all over another. Sure, the UEF can set up an untargetable satellite that can covenant style glass bases from orbit, but the Aeon can just build a giant flying saucer with an even bigger laser beam to go blow up that satellite. And then the Cybran can tell both of them to fuck off with a herd of giant mechanical crabs with enough weaponry to make America cry. I should also mention that if you capture another faction's engineer, then guess what? You can build their shit. Just imagine what you could do with a radar jamming gunship and 10 giant fucking death discs. The answer, coincidentally, is lose friends. It gets even crazier when you realize that one faction has a Tech 4 strategic... Oh. Yeah. Look, I could talk for hours about the depth that this game has, but it's time to move on to the big surprise. A lot of you have probably been wondering when I was going to mention this, and I've hinted at it earlier in the video, but in short, here it is. There's not three factions. There's four. Okay, so the reason I didn't talk about the fourth faction is that they were added with the expansion pack. And on top of that, they're kind of a spoiler for Supreme Commander 2's story, so if you don't want Supreme Commander 2's story shot to hell for you, I recommend you leave now and come back when we talk about maps. Okay? Cool. So the fourth faction is, drumroll please, the Seraphim. That's right, the alien settlement that the Earth Empire Christopher Columbus out of existence was just a small sect of a much larger species that actually lives in another dimension. A little bit after the Infinite War ends, the Seraphim, a little bit annoyed that their settlement got turned into target practice, WHAT?! WHAT THE FUCK?! sends in a massive invasion force to sterilize the whole galaxy, and boy does their kit reflect that. Their units look like if someone took uneven rocks and dipped them in chrome, and in terms of effectiveness, they have some crazy high damage units, including the only Tech 3 tanks in the game, submersible line ships, and a bomber that can essentially drop mini nukes. The campaign in the expansion is marginally better than the original, although it suffers from the same problems. It also adds a bunch of new maps into the game. Speaking of those, let's move on to maps and multiplayer and meet back up with the others. Hey, welcome back guys. Let's talk about maps, because Supreme Commander has some pretty iconic ones. Most of the maps are really well balanced in terms of resource locations and starting locations, allowing you to go with one of the many different strategies that the game has to offer in terms of how best to go about committing war crimes. Smaller maps incentivize rush strategies, while larger maps are more geared towards Fort Noxing yourself up. That brings us to multiplayer, and this game has it. Now you can just use boss on the skirmish maps, and the bots are actually really good, but playing with friends is the crux of the Supreme Commander experience. 
pilots, mostly because humans do dumb shit, and in Supreme Commander, many times that dumb shit can actually pay off. You'll understand what I mean when you lose to someone who snuck 100 underwater tanks right up to your doorstep because you didn't invest in sonar or torpedo defense. If you want to play with other people, you can either use the in-game lobby system, which is yeah, all right. Or you can use Forged Alliance forever. These guys are awesome. They created an entire third-party software to keep the multiplayer alive. As I mentioned before, you can play the campaign on co-op using this program, so they really covered all their bases. However, Forged Alliance Forever also facilitates another important aspect of the game, the modding community. So if enough unit depth to sink a cruise liner and Independence Day wasn't good enough for you, then you'll be happy to hear that the modding community for this game Fox. For example, one of my favorite mods is Orbital Wars. No longer are you limited to a microwave satellite, Orbital Wars adds space factories into the game. These allow you to make smaller frigates, line ships, and even battlecruisers, each of them able to turn entire maps into Halo Reach reenactments. You can also build anti-space guns on the ground, too, so you're somewhat safe from the enemy's assault fleet. If you want to go full Star Wars, you can even build space fighters. There's a lot of special scenario maps that these people create too, so if you get bored of nuking each other on Seedon's Clutch, you can play on a scaled map of the planet Earth if you're so inclined. Anyway, this video is starting to get a little bit long, so I think it's time we wrap things up. Supreme Commander 1 is a gem of a game. There aren't a lot of RTSs, and honestly games in general, that offer the same amount of choice, depth, and replayability that this title does. On top of that, Supreme Commander has an active base, so you're always going to be able to find someone to play against, or with, depending on your intentions. If you're not careful, this game can really suck up your time, and before you know it, it's 3am, and even though you have work tomorrow, you're too busy shelling half the map Imperial Guard style to give a shit. The only downside that I can think of is that it's a bit pricey for how old the game is, $20 on GOG, but honestly, I feel with the amount of fun that you're getting out of the game, it's worth it. Anyways, I give Supreme Commander a final score of 10 leggy boys out of the entire size of the debris map. Now, if you'll excuse me, there's some nukes I have to go launch. Strategic launch detected. 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 Strategic launch detected.